We are in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12. We've been looking at the life of David. We've been going through uh, the Old Testament chapter by chapter. We come as far as verse 15 last week. Uh, remember, David has sinned against God. He's had an affair with Bathsheba. It was another man's wife. And he's now uh, going to reap the consequences of his action. You know, the, you know sometimes we, we look at David and we think, you know, David, a man after God's own heart, you know, he got away with adultery. He didn't get away with anything. David had a, a, a very steep price to pay for his actions. God loves him. God forgives him. Dave, David comes to his senses, acknowledges what he had done. And it wasn't after, it wasn't on his own. I mean, God had, God had to pursue him. He had to send Nathan to go and expose him. But David finally comes to that place where he repents of his sin. And just because you repent of your sin doesn't mean that the consequences of your sin go away. As a matter of fact, in the book of Galatians, I think what a great passage in light of what we're looking at. In Galatians 6, 7, it says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that's what he'll reap. If he sows to the flesh, of the flesh he'll reap corruption. If he sows to the spirit, of the spirit he reaps everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season, watch this, you shall reap if you don't lose heart. And, and it was an encouragement. Look, you know, on, on the flip side of that, if you, there's consequences for sin, there's reward for obedience. There's reward for those who, you know, take heart, take heed to the things that God declares. And so, you know, David is in this place where, you know, he, he's now going to have to reap the consequences. And, and, and it's going to start right off the bat as we jump into this text. Now, you know, I, I, I wonder if we were to see the consequence of sin before we ever did the sin, if we would still do it. <laughs> you know, I, I wonder if David would have, would have said, man, because of this, I, it's going to cause, you know, all of the domino effect in my life. You know, if David would have still did what he was about to do. And hopefully, you know, you and I can take that lesson as well. You know, just, man, if I go down that road, what's it going to cost me? You know, what's going to cost my family? What's going to cost my kids? What's going to cost, you know, the, the, the community that I love, the church that I love, you know, the people that I love? How, how's it going to affect everybody else around me? Because sin has a price. And, and David's going to find it out. Notice in verse 15, it says, Nathan departed from his house. Nathan had just told him all the things that were going to happen. One of the things he had told him, jump, jump back to verse 13, and, and we back up just a minute. He says, look, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you've given great occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who's born to you shall surely die. That's the child that he had with Bathsheba while in the adulterous affair. And so there's going to be, a, you know, a cost. There's going to be a consequence. And, and Nathan had already warned David. Now, when we get to verse 15 there, it says, Nathan departs. And then it says, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. And it became ill. Now, notice how the scripture addresses Bathsheba. It was Uriah's wife. Well, then David already married her. She's already conceived and, and then bore a child. But God doesn't acknowledge her as David's wife. He acknowledges her as Uriah's wife, who's already dead. And it's interesting that, you know, God would give us his perception of things. You know, David had committed adultery and, and he had done this, this thing that was going to have great consequence and he reminds us why 
these things were happening. It was because he was having an affair with Uriah's wife. Now notice what happens in verse 16. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. David fasted. He went in and laid all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and they went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Now David, you know, is crying out to the Lord. He's fasting. You know, we were talking about fasting earlier. Fasting is, you know, depriving the physical, depriving the flesh, and really putting your attention on seeking God the spiritual. And David's fasting. He's he's crying out to God. Notice what happens. On the seventh day, I'm sorry, verse 17. So the elders of his house arose and they went to him to raise him up from the ground, but they would not, nor did he eat food. We did that. Verse 18. And the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, he spoke, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. And when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Now, you know, David's there. He's, he's still fasting. He's still on his knees. He's still crying out to the Lord. And then he hears all the grumbling in the background. The servants whispering, you know, what do we do? How do we, how do we tell David? You know, what, 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 how is he going to respond? He might hurt somebody. He might hurt himself if he finds out, you know, look how we respond. while well, the kid was still alive and now the kid's dead. And, you know, what, what are, what are we going to, you know, how are we going to address this with him? And David perceives, my son died. And at that moment it says, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he's dead. David arose from the ground. He washed and anointed himself. He changed his clothes and he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. What what, what a response. I mean, you know, David David gets up, you know, the child's already dead. And, 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 you know, he kind of comes to this place like, man, that decision's already been made by the Lord. And so he goes and he takes a shower. He goes and he, and he prepares a meal and has a meal prepared. He eats. And then it tells us there, when his servant said to him, what is this you've done? I mean, they're going, Dave, what's wrong with you? Well, why, why would you do, you know, that? I mean, you were, you were mourning and grieving and, you know, fasting and crying out to the Lord all this time. And then now you find out your son's dead and you get up and you anoint yourself and you, you know, take a shower, you have a meal. You know, what's going on? And watch what David says. I love this. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and I wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he's dead Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall not go to him, but he shall not return to me. What a perspective. And, 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 and and you know, you, you, you you have to admire David's perspective on the whole situation. Because David, David understood, you know, God might relent from what he is going to do. God might hear my prayers and, and, and not bring the consequences that he had already told me were going to happen to my son. And up until the time his son took his last breath, he was, he was, you know, holding out hope. The moment he took his last breath, it says he went and he worshiped the Lord. He didn't get bitter at God. He, he didn't go and, and say, you know, that's it. You know, it's all God's fault and I'm never talking to God again. He, he, didn't, he didn't become resentful because he knew that it was his own sin that had caused these things. And I think if we would see things from God's perspective, you know, sin is in this world and sin has destroyed so many lives. 
Sin is the one that caused so much destruction. And then the consequence the consequences of sin come and then we want to blame God. You know, it's God's fault. It's not God's fault, it's our fault. But up until the last moment, God can relent. You know, God can, God can spare. God, God can show grace. And so David wasn't going to give up until he knew that God had, did what he said he was going to do. And so he's still holding out hope. And, and, I, and I, I love that, that David had the, the perspective of eternity as well. He says, look, I'm going to go to him. Isn't that a great passage? Here's a, a child. Now, the child didn't sin. It, was, it wasn't the child who did wrong. It was David who did wrong. But this child was innocent. I believe every child that's innocent goes straight to the throne room of heaven. God, God doesn't hold a child accountable for the sins of his father. That, that, that's not what, what's happening here. You see, David brought all this about by his sin, and sin has an impact upon others. And David knew that my son is going to be in heaven. Now, th think about that. Every, every child that's innocent, man, you know, goes straight to the throne of heaven. Me, me and Marguerite and our, our first child, we had a miscarriage. And, it, you know, it was one of those times where you're just like, God, what's going on? You know, but... You, you, you realize that that child, innocent, and, and I believe when I get to heaven, I'm going to see my little boy. I, I believe every child who, who, you know, was abused and hurt and died in, in some horrific way, every abortion, every, you know, every, 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 everything that, that we don't grasp or understand on this side. And there's going to a whole population of of lives that are going to be in heaven that, you know, because, because of their innocence, man, they, they, they had to, they skipped all of the craziness down here. Now, what, what, what's interesting is that David said, look, I shall go to him. I, I'll go there, but he's not coming back here. And, and again, you know, understanding that, that this body is temporal, and one day, man, we're all going to leave this body. Every one of us will get out of here. But none of us are coming back here. <laughs> it's just, you know, and, and thank God for that. I don't know about you. I just, you know, I, 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 I don't want another time, another turn. If you believe in reincarnation, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that's, that's not something, you know, once is enough. I'm ready for heaven. I, I, want, I want to be where there's no more pain and sorrow and no more death and no more, no, no more battling with this, with this world and the devil and this flesh. You know, I mean, it, it's going to be done away with once and for all. And, and, and David, man, Dave, David understands this. You know, and even in all of his wrongdoing, he, he, he still understood and notice what happens in verse 24. It says, Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. He went into her and lie with her, lay with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. What, what, what a... What a statement. I mean, you know, this, this whole picture, like, wait a second. With Bathsheba, he has another one? And God loves this one? God, God's going to bless, and we're, we, we're going to learn a lot about Solomon in, you know, the years to come, the months to come. Solomon. God loved Solomon. And what's, what's incredible in this whole picture is God in the middle of all of this still dispenses grace. God is a gracious God. I mean, now, you know, for me, my, the first thought is like, huh, that shouldn't be. That's the Pharisee in me. <laughs> How can you let that happen, God? That's not fair. It's not right. Solomon, I mean, you know, Bathsheba and David and the, all of that. And, and yet God doesn't see how we see. 
He's a God who restores. He's a God who heals. He's a God who shows grace. When, when, when no man would show grace, God shows grace. And, and what, what, what's incredible is, is that God is going to take Solomon and make him the king of Israel. He's not the oldest son. We're, we're going we're to find out about the old, oldest son, Amnon, in a, in a moment here. He's the youngest son. He wasn't the one that was supposed to be on the throne. But it's interesting that, that God, by his grace, is going to take Solomon and make him the next king. He's, you know, it, it's just, it, it's incredible when you look at the heart of God, just how gracious he is. And so is David calls for Nathan. And look at verse 25. He went, he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. And so he called his name Jedediah because of the Lord. Now Nathan comes. Now, you know, I don't know if he wanted to see Nathan again <laughs> after that last encounter. But obviously that, that, that relationship was restored. You know, Nathan's the one who re- exposed them. You know, Nathan's the one who, you know, called them out. But now he calls Nathan again. You know, it seems like, like David in his heart is at this point where he's saying, man, I, I just want to get back. I, I, I just want to do what's right. I, I, you know, Nathan the prophet, you know, bring him over here. I, 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 want, I want him to look at my new son. And Nathan calls him not Solomon, but Jedidiah. Jedidiah means beloved of Jehovah. And so, you know, there's, there's the, the restoration of God. And, and, you know, David is experiencing that. Now, verse 26, and Joab fought against Rabbah, or Rabbah, of the people of Ammon. And took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David. And he said, I have fought against Rabbah. And I have taken the city's water supply. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together. And encamp against the city and take it. Lest I take the city. And it be called after my name. So David gathered the people together. And he went to Rabbah. And he fought against it. And he, and he took it. And he took their king's crown from his head. And he is weight was a talent of gold was precious stones it was set on david's head also he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance and he brought out the people who were in it and he put them to work with saws and iron picks and iron axes and made them cross over to the brickworks so he did all he did to all the cities of the people of Ammon, and David and all of Israel return to Jerusalem. Now, here, here's, here's an interesting picture. You know, David gets back in the battle. Remember when David was just sitting on the sidelines, when, when he was idle? That's, that's when he fell into his affair with Bathsheba. Now, you know, Joab goes, look, David, get back in the battle. You know, let, let, let's go and start fighting again. You've you, you got to respect, you know, David's... You know, David's tenacity. You know, he, he's, you know what? I, I got to get back out there and fight. You, you, how, how do you, you know, blame someone when, you know, how do you, how do you look down on someone when, when, you know, they, they realize their failure and then they get back up and they go back into the battle. They, they realize what they've done wrong and they go, you know what? I, I, I can't just lie and mope around anymore. I, I got to do what's right. And David does so, and David gets back up, he goes back in the battle. And Joab, you know, Joab loved David and wanted him to have the honors that, you know, I'm not a king, I don't want, I don't want all the, the accolades of a king. You know, get over here and th- let's take this place and let's, let's give you the, the credit for doing it. And it's, it's interesting that Joab had such a, a, a love and a care for David. Even though he knew he had done some of these things that, that were wrong. You know, he, he honored God's choice. And so it's, it's interesting how God did all of this. And, and, you know, David back in there. Now, you might think, well, okay, that's all past now. It's not. All of, you know, David's consequence, you know, little, little son that, that, that dies as a result of David's sin. And it's, it's all said and done. No, the ramifications were 
going to follow David the rest of his life. And it, it's, it's here in chapter 13. Watch this. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Ammon, the son of David, or Amnon, that's his, his name, the son of David, loved her. Now, Absalom is one of David's sons from another wife. David had up to 11 wives by this time. And it's interesting that, you know, I mean, how, how, how do you have any kind of unity? How do you have any, any kind of, you know, continuity in a home when you've got 11 different wives and, you know, different families and everyone, you know, competing against one another? And, you know, it's just David brought all of this upon himself because of his own lust, his own desires. Now he's got kids from, you know, these different wives, and one of them was Absalom, and he had a sister by the name of Tamar, and she was beautiful, the Scripture tells us. Her name literally means palm tree. And she was so beautiful that her brother couldn't stop thinking about her. It says he loved her. It wasn't God's love. This, this, this would be better described as lust. And it's interesting, you know, David kind of sets the example, and now, now he's got a, a son who, who's, who's also doing things immoral. You know, and, and watch this. Ammon, who, Amnon, I'm sorry, was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick for she was a virgin and it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. Now Amnon knew that she was off limits. He, he was aware that, you know, you're, you're not, she was a half-sister, but, you know, it wasn't right for me to, 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 to be with her, to marry her, to have any relations with her. He was very aware that that was against God's law. In the book of Leviticus 18.9, it says, The nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether born at home or elsewhere, their nakedness you shall not uncover. I mean, it, it, was, it was a given. You know, incest was something that was forbidden. And... Ammon aware of it. Now, verse 3, it says, Ammon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. Now, let's just clarify something. It wasn't a friend. <laughs> when someone encouraged you to do something against God, that's not a friend. That's an enemy. Because really, he's causing destruction upon your own life, upon your own soul. And how can someone who's looking for your destruction really be, be considered someone who's a friend? This Jonadab, he was the son of Shimei and David's brother. Now, Jonadab, he was really his cousin, right? And Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, why are you the king's son becoming thinner day after day? Now, you know, he was so consumed by Tamar that he was losing weight. He wasn't eating right. You know, you ever see young couples and they're in love and all of a sudden they get skinny? You know, they're just, I'm just so in love. You know, they, they, they not, you know they're getting buffer, they're getting skinnier, they're getting... It, something about love, <laughs> Something about, you know, in, in this case, lust. <laughs> and, and so, you know, he, he's here and he's becoming skinnier and skinnier. His, his, his cousin, Joan, Jonadab, acknowledged, you know, asked him, you know, what's going on with you? Why, why are you getting so skinny, man? You're the king's son. You, you could be eating, you know, lamb chops every day. You, you can be feasting at, at the king's table. You know, what, what, what's up with you? Watch this. Why are your king's son becoming thinner day after day? 
Will you not tell me? And Am- Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So Jonabab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me food and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. And Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight that I may eat from her hand. And David sent home to Tamar, saying, Now go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her, her brother Amnon's house. He was lying down. She took flour, kneaded it, made cakes in his side, and baked the cakes. She took the pan and placed them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. And Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the bedroom that it may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. And when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and he said to her, come, lie with me, my sister. And she said to him, no, my brother, do not force me for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not let this disgraceful, or do not do this disgraceful thing. And I, where could I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. I mean, you know, what, 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 what a tragic thing. He actually takes the counsel of of, uh, his cousin, Jonadab. Pretends like he's sick, and then he gets Tamar to come and bake him cakes, and, and then he rapes her, his own sister. And again, you know, those who counsel to do evil, and you should... Keep them far from you. Do you have friends that, that approve of, of, you know, of sin or they, they kind of antagonize towards sin? Man, you know, those are the people you, you, need, you need to kind of, you know, take off your friend list, off your Facebook. <laughs> get, get, them, get them out, out of that place in your life where they're, 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 you're going to hear their counsel or you're, you're going to, you know, heed their counsel. You know, you, th- these are the people that don't have your best interest at heart. Can you imagine if Jonabab would have heard that and he says, look, man, that, that's not cool, dude. That's your sister. And he would have took her to the scripture and then prayed with them and, you know, and, and tried to encourage them to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing. You know, it could have been a whole different conclusion at that point. He could have come to his senses, but, but no, he, he takes the heat of, of this conniver. And even Tamar, she pleads with him, look, you're, you're going to shame me. I mean, where am I, what am I going to do? If you rape me, if you go and do this, you know, I, I'm not going to be wanted by anybody. And that, and that culture, you know, that, that, that wasn't something acceptable. You would basically be, um, you know, set aside. And she knew, it. you know, well, where would I go? What am I going to do if you do this to me? And not only that, you're going to be the fool. You're, you're, going to, you're, going to, you're going to be someone who brings disgrace. And then it, it, it's, it's sad, but there in verse 14 it says, however, he would not heed her voice. By this point, you know, it had already settled in. You know, he was determined. The thing about sin is that you let it just fester. You, you just let it sit there long enough, man, and, and it, it just gets to the point where you're at the point of no return. And I, I think that, that that's why the Scripture warns us over and over about what we meditate on, what we think about. 
The scripture warns us over and over, you know, the, the, the things that, that, that are in your heart, you know, you, you have to purge them while they're in their heart, you know, before they begin to grow in your heart. Because once they grow in your heart, then, you know, you now become more emboldened to do those things. In the book of James, chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. You see, God doesn't tempt. It's the flesh and the devil and this world. And it's ourselves. It says here in, in James 14, uh, one, chapter 1, verse 13, 14, it says, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires. Each one's tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and then he's enticed. And then it says, then when desire has conceived. Isn't that an interesting passage? Desire is conceived. That's the same word used from a child being conceived. It just gets planted there. And when it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then it says, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. And the only way to not bring forth death is you have to abort the thought. You have to get, you have to purge. You know, because you sit there and think about it long enough and you, you know, play it out in your mind long enough, eventually you'll act upon it. That's, that's why when sin begins to, you know, the enticement comes, when, when, when the temptation comes, you, you, you have to ask God, God, you know, take that thought away, take that desire away, take that, you know, just thing that's in front of me, away from me. Because if you don't, you know, you'll play with it long enough to pretty soon you're, gonna, you're already made your plan on how to act upon it. If, if that's, you know, something sexual, you've you got, you got to make sure you're not putting those things in front of you. Pornography. Flirting with, you know, uh, other, other women, you know, other men. It, it just, you just sit there and play with it long enough, man, it, the opportunity will come. When it comes to drugs and alcohol, you know, if that's something you struggle with, you, you know, you, you don't go and put yourself in that environment or in, in that position or with other people that are doing those things that you know you're susceptible to. Because the longer you're there, you know, dwelling on it and around it, you know, the easier it is to compromise that. And so it's interesting that he had already plotted this thing. You know, it, it wasn't something that just happened. It was something that, that you know, he was, he was planning. It was something he was plotting. And then he finally acts upon it. Now she's there begging him, you know, don't do this, don't do this. And it says, he did not heed her. Now verse, verse 13, it says, and it's, or verse 14, I'm sorry, and however, he would not heed her voice and being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. And Ammon hated her exceedingly so that the hatred by which he had hated her was greater than the love with which he loved her. And Ammon said to her, arise and be gone. You know, as soon as he did it, he, you know, he, guilt and shame began to settle in. He knows, you know, what he had done was wrong. And now every time he looks at Tamar, he's reminded of his own sin. And so now he, you know, begins to project his, you know, hatred uh, for himself upon her, you know, as, as though she did something wrong when she did nothing wrong. And, and, and it's wild because he hated her as much as he loved her at one time. You know, now every time he sees her, he just, you know, repulsed by her because of what he had did. And then wa watch this. And she said to him, no, indeed, this evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. You know, you, you, know, you now doing this and then now, you know, kicking me out the door and, you know, not even trying to man up to the, what you've done. That's even worse than what you've already done. And so he doesn't heed her still. And, and no, notice this. It's going to cost him too. And 
he called a servant who had attended him and he said, here, put this woman out away from me and bolt the door behind her. And she had on a robe of many colors for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel and his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her and Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors and that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, has Ammon, your brother, been with you? But now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother's Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. And Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Now what's interesting is, you know, all of this goes down. Tamar goes back. She stays at Absalom's house. That was her brother. And what's interesting in all of this is that David never addresses it. David never goes and, you know, rebukes uh, 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 Amnon for doing what he had done. David just kind of ignores all of it. And you got to wonder, you know, why wouldn't David say something? It was some ramification, some, some acknowledgement of what had happened. And I would venture to say that it was because of his own sin. You see, the thing about sin is that Sin, when we're guilty of it, it makes us less bold to stand up against it. Because then, then we're like, yeah, I'm going to be a hypocrite. If I go and say something, you know, look what I did. I mean, how can I go and say something? And David with his own children won't even correct them, won't even rebuke them, won't even declare to them what they did was wrong. And I think that's another ploy of the enemy. And you know, we may fail and falter. It doesn't make what God declares wrong. It makes us wrong. And so when we blow it, it, it you know, it, it's not that we can't speak truth any longer. It's that, man, I, I'm now guilty of that, and I need to just be acknowledge that, that what I did was wrong. God's still right. And guys, I, I, I think as parents, you know, with, with our own children, the enemy would love nothing more for us to ju just to, to, to just kind of like, well, I, I really don't have no right to say anything because look what I did. You know, that, that, that's just a lie from the pit of hell. I think we've got to stand for truth and then acknowledge our own failures and faults and you let it be an example of what not to do instead of just ignoring it altogether. And, and you know, I, I think it, it became one of David's failures. Now, verse 23, and we'll, we'll try to get to the end of the chapter. Watch what he says. It came to pass after two full years. Absalom had sheep shears and Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim. So Absalom invited all the king's sons. Absalom came to the king and said, kindly note, your servant has sheep shears. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. And the king said to Absalom, no, my son, let us not all go now, lest we be a burden to you. And he urged him, but he would not go, and he blessed him. And Absalom said, if not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him, why should he go with you? And Absalom urged him, so he let Amnon and all of the king's sons go with him. And Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Watch now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, Strike Amnon, then kill him, do not be afraid, for I commanded you, be courageous and valiant. The servant of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded, and all the king's sons arose, and each one got on his mule and fled. And it came to pass while they were on the way that news came to David saying, Absalom has killed all the king's sons and not one of them is left. And so the king arose and tore his garments and laid on the ground and all of his servants stood with him with their clothes torn. Then Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother, 
answered and said, Let not my Lord suppose that they have killed all the young men, the king's son, for only Amnon is dead. For my command of for by the command of Absalom this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Did you see who brought David the news? It was Jonadab. The one that encouraged Amnon to go and do the thing that he, you know, that he had done. What, 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 a, what, a, what a picture. <laughs> the, the, the very one that, that was, that was you know, in, in, egging him on is now the one who's coming and saying, David, you know, David, not everyone's dead. It was just, it was just Amnon. He's, he's the only one dead. And it's because of what he did to Tamar. Well, you're the one who encouraged him to do it. And, and Absalom never forgave him. And th this is what's interesting. Watch this. For the command of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Absalom had planned this for two years. For two years. It's, it's, it's that same scenario. You just let it sit in your heart long enough. You just let it dwell, whether it's lust or whether it's hatred, you know, you just let it sit there long enough and at some point it's going to lash out. And Absalom, you know, now is the one who's guilty. You know, he's the one who commits murder. It was at his hand that all of this happens. And so you, you, you have, you know, sexual morality. You, 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 got, you got, you know, murder taking place. And all of these things are exactly what David had done. Remember, it wasn't just Bathsheba. It was Uriah that was killed. Her husband, as he put him into the battle. And all the things that David did now are coming back. Because sin, when it's not dealt with, you know, when, when, when it's not confronted, man, when, when, it, when it just sits there and, and, and festers, it, it, it just continues to... to Breed. Because David wouldn't stand up when, when, when his son uh, Amnon did that to his daughter. You know, now I've, I've got to take it in my own hand. He won't even do nothing. You know, he, he won't even say nothing. And, and now he goes and, and now he commits murder. You know, it, 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 just, it just propagates. And what, what, what's, what's astounding in this whole picture is now their whole family's devastated. Absalom, Amnon, dead. Absalom, we're going to find, has to flee. And then, and then he's, he's never going to be truly, you know, welcomed back into the family. And, and he's going to turn on David. And, and, you know, he's going to be the one who sleeps with all of David's uh, concubines. And it, it, it's just the turmoil that happens because of sin. And it should be a warning. It should be one of those things like, man, is it really worth it? Is the pleasure for the minute gonna, 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 you know, really worth all of the pain that it's gonna produce? And then taking the counsel of someone who, you know, who, who doesn't know God, who doesn't love God, is, is that really the right path to take? And you, you have so, so many pictures in, in the life of David. L look at verse 33. Now therefore let not my Lord the king take this thing to heart to think that all the king's sons are dead. It's only Amnon is dead. And Absalom fled, and the young men who were keeping watch lifted his eyes and looked, and there many people were coming from the road on the hillside behind him. And Jonadab said to the king, Look, the king's sons are coming, as your servant said. So it is. And so it was as soon as he had finished speaking that the king's son indeed came, and they lifted their voice and they wept. And the king and all of his servants wept very bitterly. And Absalom fled, and he went to Telmi, the son of Amud. King of Gusher, and David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and he went to Gusher, and he was there for three years. And David longed to go to Absalom, for he had been comforted concerning Amnon because he was dead. Now, you know, just, just, the, the, just the destruction, you know, the vision that took place in his family, and, and we've just begun. Just scratched the surface. Of, of, you know, David's woes, you know, the, the, the consequences. And, and, it's, and it's, it's a sad 
story. Now, you know, D- David still's going to lead and, you know, God's still going to use him and G- David still has hope. It wasn't hopeless, but there was still a pain that he would, he would have to endure for the rest of his life. And, and I, I don't want to, you know, not take that warning. Because I, I think we can look at David and go, man, what, what, what an awesome guy. And, what, what, you know, the, the, the king of Israel and all of the victories he had and all of the, the, the you know, accolades and the wealth and the women. I mean, this guy had everything. No, because of his sin, all of it was tainted. He, he would never be what he was before. Now, God was gracious. God... God was able to use him still. But he was now like a bird that had his wings clipped. He'll he'll never rise to the same heights that he had before. And and I think, you know, guys, there's there's warnings here. There's warnings for me. You know, as a pastor, I you know, I go, man, you know, these these if David, the man after God's own heart, could go to that degree. You know, what none of us are, are exempt. None of us. We all have to guard our hearts. You know, whenever something starts to just fester in your heart, if you don't, if you don't purge it, man, it, it, it'll continue to grow. If there's some hatred in your heart for somebody and you just let it stay there, man, it, it will continue to grow and, and you have to come and just, you know, Lord, take that out of me. I don't want to live my life bitter like Absalom. I, 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 don't, I don't want to walk around, you know, just, just with, with this resentment. And, and every time I think of this name or this person, you know, I, I, just, I just want to, I want to, I want to murder them. That, that's where Absalom was. And the cost is enormous. A- Absalom ends up dying in a battlefield because he turns on his father, David. I mean, it's just, it's just this tragic story all the way around. And, you know, God help us. God help us to take the warnings that God gives so that, that you and I can stand back, you know, at the end of it and say, man, I, I, I didn't have to experience that because I saw it in his life. And I, 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 didn't, want to, I didn't want to go down that same road.